As Your Honour pleases, the first uh, witness today will be Mr. Vincent Tu. Uh, it's necessary for you to be sworn. Would you take an oath on the Bible? Yes, certainly. <clears throat> just excuse my voice a little bit. It's uh, That's all right. problems. Would you just hold the Bible and repeat after me, I swear by Almighty God. I swear by Almighty God. That the evidence I shall give in this Royal Commission. That the evidence I shall give in this Royal Commission. Shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Thank you. Take a seat. Yes, Mr. Stewart. Mr. Toole, will you state your full names, please? Vincent Joseph Toole. Do you have a copy to hand of your statement dated 10 July 2015? Yes, I do. Are there any amendments or corrections you wish to make to the statement? No. Do you confirm the statement to be true and correct? Yes. I attended the statement, Your Honour. Mr. Toole's statement will be Exhibit 2923. Now, Mr. Toole, as I understand it, you were baptised as a Jehovah's Witness in 1972, is that right? Yes, that's correct. How old were you then? Uh, I was born in 1948, so uh, probably 23, 24. And how did you come to be a Jehovah's Witness? I was... Uh, I moved into a unit with someone who was having a, a Bible study... I'd been brought up quite religiously. I'd attended a religious boarding school for five years prior to that, but after I left school, I basically stopped attending church. And uh, later on, when I moved into this unit, this man was studying. I'd never really read a Bible before. But Mr. Tool, sorry to interrupt you. I'm just looking for a short answer. So oh. you were introduced through someone you were sharing. Yes, and uh, I studied and was satisfied this was the truth and I wanted to uh, dedicate my life to serve God. Thank you. And you were appointed an elder, as I understand it, in 1977, is that right? Yes, that's correct. And as I understand it, between being baptised and being appointed an elder, typically there would be no formal... Uh, full-time training that someone would go through before being appointed an elder? No formal training, no. Yes. So it would be through involvement in the various activities of the congregation and yeah. the teaching and so on, etc.? No tertiary education or anything like that. It was just involvement in the church, application and involvement as such. Yes. And you were a circuit overseer from 1980 to 1989, is that right? Yes. And from 1989, you commenced working at the um, branch headquarters, is that right? Yes, that's correct. And would it be right to refer to that as Bethel? Yes, that's another term. And, and that term is also used to refer to the world headquarters in Brooklyn, is that right? Yes, that's correct. Now... When you commenced working at branch headquarters, is it then that you commenced your legal studies? Yes, not long after I arrived there. Yes. And did the branch committee or did the Jehovah's Witnesses then sponsor your legal studies? Yes. And in 1993, you completed those studies and were admitted as a solicitor, is that right? Yes, that's correct. And since then, you've done legal work for uh, Jehovah's Witness Australia or Watchtower and Bible and Track Society Australia on a voluntary basis. Is yes, that right? that's correct. Yes. And since 1995, you have also had your own legal practice under the name Vincent Toole Solicitor. Yes, that's correct. And that legal practice, does that do independent work outside of Jehovah's Witness work or do you only do Jehovah's Witness work through that practice? Primarily just Jehovah's Witness work, but I've done work for my family and other people. Yes. Um, but am I, I to understand you don't run it as a commercial no, law practice? not as a commercial practice, no. And since 2010, as I understand it, you've had oversight of the legal department in Australia, is that right? Yes, that's correct. So you were involved in the legal department, am I right, 
since 1989 and had oversight since 2010. That's correct. And I take it then you also live at Bethel? Yes, I do. And you, your daily needs are provided for as a member of the worldwide order of special full-time servants of Jehovah's Witnesses, is that right? Yes, that's correct. Yes, in much the same way that Mr. Spinks described yesterday. Yes, exactly. And if I can refer to your statement and starting at paragraph 13. Paragraph 13? Yes. Mm -hmm. You say all elders serving in congregations of Jehovah's Witnesses throughout the world have been directed to contact the legal department in their local branch as soon as they learn of an allegation involving child sexual abuse. So am I to understand that the, there's a uniform um, process set out which applies throughout the world? Subject to the fact, of course, that uh, many branches mightn't have a legal department, but they would contact the branch there. But uh, in Australia, we do have a legal department. Yes. And that um, process, which is applicable throughout the world, uh, that's determined by the governing body? Well, it's a general direction throughout the world, as I understand. Yes, and it's a general direction throughout the world determined by the governing body. Well, as far as I understand, it's a, it's a direction that uh, elders have been given. Yes, but um, Mr. Toole, you seem to be trying to avoid what I understand to be quite well accepted, which is that it's the governing body that determines that direction. That's what I understand, yes. Yes. And that's typical, is it, of all Jehovah's Witnesses policies and procedures, that is, they're determined by the governing body and made applicable throughout the world. Yes, the general policy would be determined by the governing body, but the application of it in the local setting would depend on the branch committee applying it to, to the relevant things in their local area. Well, yes, whether a policy is actually followed in practice is a separate question, but dealing with the setting of, the, of the, what the practice is supposed to be, that's set by the governing body. That's what I understand. Yes. And... Coming to the question of responses to child sexual abuse allegations specifically, the Australia branch then follows the guidelines of the governing body, is that right? The guidelines, but they will apply it in, in any way that needs to be adjusted in the local, for the local area. Well, let's just be clear on that. The particular application may vary from case to case, is that yes. right? Yes, yes. But... Uh, that application is intended to be within the parameters of the policy or procedure itself. Is that right? Yes, I'd agree with that. And it's the case, is it not, that the Australia branch uh, office <coughs> will not itself set any practice or policy to apply normatively unless it's been approved by the governing body? In terms of policy, uh, they will adjust it to the local circumstances. So, for example, if there was no legal department in Australia, for example, well, that direction wouldn't apply, so they'd have to adjust it to whatever the local situation was. Well, there wouldn't then be a direction from the governing body that the legal department should be contacted. In a country where there was no legal department, the direction from the governing body which the branch would then set or apply would be that the branch office be contacted. Yes, that's them. right. Yes. Now, is there a constitution by which the Jehovah's Witnesses uh, internationally are governed? I don't think I could answer that, but my understanding is clearly just what the Bible has to say. Because just seeking to address it for a moment from a legal perspective, 
uh, what I understand from the statements is that one has a governing body operating in or situated in New York, but having an operation, I suppose, throughout the world, and then branches in various geographic areas and also congregations yes. within the jurisdiction of each branch. That's right so far, isn't it? Yes. Um, and in Australia it's said that each congregation is a, in a legal sense, voluntary association, is that right? Yes. And yet the congregations take their direction and instructions from the branch, which in turn takes its direction and instruction from the governing body, that would be right factually? Yes, I think that's a reasonable... So now, by w operation of what legal rule or norm does, does that occur? In other words, by what Sorry. legal rule or norm does the congregation take its direction from the branch? Is there a constitution, a contract, a corporation? Is there something that does it? Not that I'm aware of. So is it, is it not the case that the governing body uh, sets out what the roles and responsibilities of all the various structures are and their relationship to each other and, these, and the whole system internationally is operated in accordance with that? You're really talking to me about an area I don't have much experience in in terms of that. I just work in a local branch. But uh, I think in general terms what you're saying I would understand to be correct. And is there a, a manual or a document uh, published by the governing body which, which sets that out, what its responsibilities are, what the branch's responsibilities are and so on? I'm unaware of any such document. So is there not, to your knowledge, a document which sets out the responsibilities of each of the governing body committees, for example? I have no knowledge about that whatsoever. And a document, perhaps, which uh, sets out how members of branch committees are to be appointed? I have no knowledge about that. I've never seen or heard of such things. Can I just understand, <coughs> are you the senior lawyer advising the Jehovah's Witness in Australia? I'm not sure about senior, but I look, I look after the, uh, the legal department, but I'm being asked questions about things that I really haven't been involved in at all. I know, but I'm trying to get to understand your relationship to the management structure in Australia and in New York, you see. Um, and normally in an organisation, if there's a legal department and a head lawyer, then um, that person's services would be used to advise in relation to documents, um, the meaning of documents, the drafting of documents and so on. Nothing. I've never been involved in any of the document types of situations that I'm being asked about at all. Uh, well, then who in the branch here uh, holds the reins? Where does... The, the branch committee. committee. The committee. And how many people are on that committee? Probably nine or ten, but it might be... It's around that figure. I'm not actually so certain, but it's somewhere around that figure. And is that their job, to be members of that committee, or do they have other roles in the organisation? They are appointed members of the branch committee. They collectively serve together, but they would have uh, administrative roles... At the branch, doing different things? At the branch, though. Yes, at they're the all, branch. They're all people who work at the branch. Yes, they're at and, the branch. And is one of them the head, as it were, of the committee? I think it's first among equals. I don't think anyone's head of the branch committee as such, but uh, the uh, Mr O'Brien cares for the coordination of that particular branch committee. But I don't think anyone has greater authority or lesser authority. If you remember the branch committee, I understand you're... You're an equal member with the branch committee. And the next step in the hierarchy uh, organisation of the Jehovah's Witness from the branch committee is to where? I think the branch committee goes back to the governing body. In New York? In New York. That's as I understand it. Right. 
And um, do you know whether they have to provide a report to the governing body? I've never been on a branch committee. I don't know what happens there. You mean you, you work as the Jehovah's Witness lawyer, but you have no knowledge of what... I have never been involved in a report given that way because it's not a legal matter. It's Nothing's been ever discussed with me about that. And the branch committee members, Mr Tool, are appointed by the governing body, is that right? I understand that's the position, yes. And you say your understanding is, is that the branch committee members are are equal, so one of them is actually designated coordinator, is that, is that not right? Yes, I think he's the coordinator of the, of the, uh, the branch committee. Yes, and that designation or responsibility also is an appointment by the governing body? I believe so, but I'm not absolutely certain, but I believe so. I'm sorry I don't have a lot of information on that, but I just, I've never been involved. There are other copies coming shortly, but I'd just like to show you, um, uh, there's a copy for you, I'd like to show you a document. <coughs> Uh, you see <clears throat> it's headed branch organization, effective December 15, 1977, revised February 2003, and it's said to be, um, what says this material is branch organization, sorry, this material in the branch organization, being the name of the publication, should not be copied or duplicated except with the permission of the branch committee. It's, it's published in the USA. Take it or understand it by the governing body. Have, have you seen this publication before? No, I have not. Do you know if this is the current edition? I would have no idea. Um, Your Honour, I, I call for any revision or, or subsequent edition to the publication branch organisation. Uh, Your Honour, well, um, until just then it wasn't called for, uh, but we'll, I'll have a look. Sorry, I'm... I'll have an inquiry made about it. If there are revisions. Well, more than that, we'd, we'd like to know the answer. Of course, Your Honour. Your Honour, um, without wishing to interrupt my learned friend's line of questioning, I, uh, um, Mr O'Brien is coming to give evidence today. It may be that some of these questions are best directed towards him. Well, we'll let counsel take his course. Of course, Your Honour. Understood. Uh, Your Honour, one final thing, if I may. Um, uh, could I ask for a non-publication order in respect of that? I would assume that it is a very confidential document. Well, you'd have to persuade me of that, Mr. Topley. Um, the Royal Commission, as far as possible, operates in public. Understood, Your Honour. And I, presently, I'm not, I can't see why this document shouldn't be a public document, but yes. you'd have to persuade me. Thank you, Your Honour. I, I might take instructions over the morning break. Thank you. Well, I haven't tended it yet, um, Your Honour, but I am grateful to well, my I think I think we assume it's coming. Yes, yes, it is. Um, I'm, I'm grateful to my learned friend in relation to what he says about Mr. O'Brien because really that underscores the point that we really need, if there is such a document, a revision or updated version of this, we really need it during the course of the morning so that Mr. O'Brien's evidence later in the day can um, serve some purpose. Well, do you seek to tender it now? There's no need to tender it right now, Your Honour. I'll allow my learned friend to take his instructions <coughs> with regard to <coughs> publication order or otherwise. All right. Now, can <coughs> I take you, um, Mr. Tool, to paragraph 15 of your statement? 15? 15, yes. That's from the tail of 03. You'll see you say there, where the law does not require ministers of religion to report allegations of child abuse, the legal department has been instructed to direct the elders to clearly explain to the victim and or their families that they have an absolute right to report the matter to the authorities and that they should feel completely free to do so. So you say there, the legal department has been instructed to direct, and then you go on to say what you've been instructed to direct. Um, who gave that instruction? Well, I understand that's just a branch committee direction in harmony with the, the directions we've been given. 
So it's a, well, let's just clarify the terminology there. You say the branch, the, the legal department has been instructed. So is, it, is that the case? The legal department has been instructed to direct, as you said, out in that paragraph? In harmony with uh, the direction that we were given in that previous letter about uh, reporting. Uh, my understanding clearly is that's the direction that we are expected to give whenever we receive a call in relation to this matter. So it's the branch committee that's given that instruction to the legal department? Uh, I understand in harmony with that letter. All right. Are you in harmony with which letter? The letter that uh, referred to just a little earlier, that one there, October the 1st, 2012. And that's it. Tab 124. And that certainly is our practice. Well, can you identify where in the letter the legal department is instructed or directed to direct elders to clearly explain to the victim and or their families that they have an absolute right to report the matter to the authorities? No, I can't, but it's in the, it's in the spirit of what's being discussed there. It's always been my understanding that that's the direction that we're to give. Well, Mr. Tool, just to be clear, you say in your, in your statement that the legal department has been instructed to do something. I understand now you've, you're shifting from that and you're saying that that's in the spirit of yeah. this letter. It's not an instruction, is that right? We don't have a written instruction to do that, no, if that's what you're asking. Well, you don't have any instruction, do you? Well, we've been informed that's what we should be uh, advising people when they call. Isn't it the case that the legal department advises on legal obligations uh, to report or otherwise, and then with regard to other matters, uh, the call from the elders is then passed on to the service desk? I've been taking these calls for the pretty well exclusively now for the last two or more years. The direction I give specifically when someone calls in, we discuss the matter as far as any mandatory reporting obligations that may apply, and then I make a particular point. I say, now, I want if the mandatory reporting obligation doesn't apply in a certain state, I say, I want you to, two elders to go back to the victim or their family and explain to them very clearly that they have the absolute right to be able to go and report this matter to the authorities. That's their privilege, and they need to understand that and that you will support them in whatever decision they make. That's the instructions I give every time. So that's, that's your practice as that's opposed to being something you've been instructed to do? Well, I don't... I haven't received formal instructions, that's what I'm saying, but... That's what I understand clearly we're being asked to do. And you say you've done this exclusively for, did you say, two years or two and a half years? Yeah, about approximately two years. That's what I've been taking the calls myself. And these are calls about allegations of child sexual abuse? Yes. And how many such calls have you taken in that period, would you estimate? I couldn't tell you, but we're probably at three, sometimes four, a month. And in respect of any of those, did you take the view that mandatory reporting requirements applied and therefore that the elders concerned had an obligation to report? Yes. And in respect of which states would those be? South Australia and Victoria. I refer you to the Shepherd the Flock of God handbook, that's tab 120. And 
in particular at page 133. Page 133, that's right, under the heading Taking Brothers to um, Court. Now, are you familiar with this um, section of this handbook, I take it, Mr. Tool? Reasonably familiar. And <clears throat> there's a strong scriptural message or scripturally based message here in these paragraphs 22 and 23, isn't there, against the referral to secular authorities um, of disputes. This is entirely civil matters, yes. nothing to do with criminal. Well, this is, this is what I, I wanted to come to. Come to. Um, is it not the case, though, that... Well, <clears throat> I'll withdraw that. What is the basis for you saying that that's entirely civil and not criminal? Well, this is dealing with situations where people have personal differences. Maybe there's a difficulty with work. Maybe there's a a situation with uh, defamation or situations that people may well have a dispute with each other. And so the, the admonition is, well, why not apply scriptural principles to try and resolve the matter? But it has... there, And if you go on a little further, it actually speaks about there are some things that even though they are personal matters, civil matters between uh, individuals, they're the kind of thing that the congregation has no authority or no jurisdiction to be able to adjudicate on, things like custody matters, probate matters, and things like that. So it's just dealing with issues that exist between individuals, but certainly not criminal matters in any way, shape, or form. You would appreciate that, uh, if not all, certainly in, in most circumstances that might give rise to a criminal charge a civil wrong would also have occurred which might give rise to a civil claim or dispute? Well, that's potentially possible, yes. Yes. Well, let's be more specific. In the case of a sexual abuse uh, allegation, that may give rise to both a criminal charge and a civil claim. All I can tell you is that that particular scripture does not prevent... Well, it's going to help us if you just answer my question. I'm not talking yeah. about the scripture. I asked you a very specific question, which between you and I as lawyers, we should be able to discuss and sure. find common ground quite easily. What I said to you is, in the case of a sexual abuse allegation, the facts of the allegation may give rise to both a criminal charge and a civil claim. Yes, potentially. So a person who's been abused would have an issue with, or a dispute with their abuser, which might give rise in the law to two uh, matters to be resolved, one criminal and one civil. Potentially, yes. And is it not the case then that, absent any clear guidance to the contrary, that publishers who have access to this information like this would understand it to mean that their dispute, which arises from a sexual abuse allegation, is <coughs> not to be referred to the courts, no, whether, I, whether that's the criminal component or the civil component. No, I completely disagree. Well, you would have heard... Well, I withdraw that. Did, did you uh, follow the evidence in the Commission last week? Yes. <coughs> particularly of the two survivors, BCB and BCG, yes. gave evidence? Yes, I did. So you will have heard BCB give evidence that she was taught that these passages applied equally to criminal complaints. I did hear her say that. I can tell you paragraph 16 of your statement. The quote that you have in that paragraph um, says that there is no obligation on elders to report if the law does not oblige it. This is paragraph 16, did you say? Yes, that's mm -hmm. right. 
So where the law does not obligate elders to report cases that come to their attention, there is no need for them to do so. But if the matter becomes known to the authorities, they must cooperate, um, and so on. Or it doesn't actually say that they are required to disclose information they have in their possession, that they will do so unless they can claim ecclesiastical um, privilege. Now, as I understand it, and since you're the one who advises on reporting obligations, um, <clears throat> perhaps you, you can confirm within the Jehovah's Witness view of things, in the absence of a legal obligation to report to authorities, whether police or child protection authorities, there's no moral obligation to report, is that right? Elders do not have the scriptural authority to take away the right of an individual to decide whether or not they want to pursue the matter or not. They have the right to make a decision in terms of their own best interests. Well, you'll appreciate, Mr Tool, that there are often circumstances in which an individual can't exercise such a right, such as a child, for example, um, whose parent, for whatever reason, doesn't exercise that right of reporting on their behalf. Well, their guardian parent would be perfectly entitled to decide what's in their best interest. And if their guardian parent did not report or told the elders, the elders I'm not reporting, for, by reason, for example, if she doesn't want the abusing father to be charged and potentially go to jail, but the child remains uh, at risk, would that not within the Jehovah's Witness view of things, give rise to a moral obligation on the elders to report in order to protect the child. And that's why they contact the service department and they discuss the whole situation and work out how best to be able to protect the child. There might be a whole lot of other avenues that the service department, in conjunction with the, uh, the local elders, can discuss about how that's to be done. But at the end of the day, if, uh, if you go back to an article that we have published in 1985, it said when you hear a report of child abuse, whatever is necessary to be done needs to be done to protect the child. So would it be right that in some circumstances there would be a need for elders to report to the authorities? There may well be, yes. And you see then where this... Um quote says there is no need for them to do so. Do you see that? Where the law does not oblige elders to report cases that come to their attention, there is no need for them to do so. That, uh, Just where are, you, where are you reading from? In, in the quote. Oh, in the quote. From yeah, in, in italics. <laughs> where the law does not oblige elders to report cases that come to their attention, there is no need for them to, to do so. So that's indeed a discouragement to elders from reporting, isn't it? No, I think you're possibly reading it a little in isolation. What that's saying in terms of mandatory reporting obligations, if there's an obligation to report, the elders report. If they don't have an obligation to report, well then as far as their legal obligation is concerned, well then they have no requirement to report. It's not discussing leaving people in or out of danger, it's just simply stating what their obligation is under the law. Uh, could I show you tab 131A? Which is a very recent document, 6th of November 2014, a letter from... Uh, the branch to all bodies of elders, and it's headed Procedures When Legal Issues Are Involved. Um, you were probably involved in drafting this letter, were you, Mr. Tool? No, I was not. But you're familiar with it, I take it? Reasonably, yes. Perhaps we can go to the third page, paragraph 14. which deals with handling reports of crime, when elders learn of alleged criminal activity on the part of one of Jehovah's Witnesses or someone associated with the congregation as the accused or the victim, they should immediately call the legal department. And then it goes on. You can read it to yourself if you like, but 
I think it's the seventh line down on the left hand side it starts strict confidentiality do you see that yes strict confidentiality must be maintained to avoid unnecessary entanglement with secular authorities who may be conducting a criminal investigation of the matter now just in relation to that um, th this approach presupposes that any report of criminal activity is, is confidential. That would be right. Can you restate the question, please? Well, this, what is stated here presupposes that an allegation of criminal activity is confidential. No. It presupposes that as far as the elders in dealing with the matter, information is confidential, but... And the other aspect, they don't want to get involved or in any way disturb a police investigation or situation like that. But of course, that confidentiality then, as I understand it, is confidentiality within the congregation. Is that right? Well, it's within the confidentiality, but within the the person who's actually hearing it, in fact, it would be the elder dealing with the matter, if they were dealing with it. Yes, and other than as provided for to have to tell the body of elders where that's required, uh, that information would not be passed or should not be passed by that elder to others in the congregation? No, they keep it confidential. But there would be no breach of that confidentiality in the elder reporting an allegation of criminal activity to the authorities, would it? Well, I guess that would depend on the circumstances, but uh, in actual fact, they are breaching confidentiality to do that, but that may well be necessary in certain circumstances. Yes. Well, I understand in certain circumstances it may be, but it's not necessarily so. In other words, if someone reports that they, to an elder, that they saw some criminal activity, let's say robbery or something, absent a specific request from the person reporting that it be kept confidential, there would be no obligation of confidentiality on the elder, surely. <coughs> Not in relation to that matter, unless they were handling it themselves, they've only got second-hand information there. And passing information to the authorities would not, as it's um, put there, produce an entanglement uh, with the secular authorities. It would merely be making a report to the secular authorities. If they were simply passing on that information, no, it wouldn't be... A they're passing on a comment that they've heard from someone else. Isn't that what you're asking? Well, yes, that, that is what I'm asking. So in the case of, of um, a sexual abuse allegation, it's, you would accept it's the victim's confidentiality. Yes, and their right to be able to preserve or decide what they want done about it. Yes, and if the victim does not require of the elder to not report, then there's no breach of confidentiality in reporting. If the victim was quite happy for the uh, elder to report, uh, there'd be no reason why the elder wouldn't uh, maybe even accompany the parent along to make sure that the report was made. There's no reason why that wouldn't be done. For example, in that case, uh, one of those reporting situations that I mentioned in Victoria, that's exactly what was done. They... Uh, the two elders went to the police, spoke to the parent, the parent and the two elders went to the police and reported the matter. Because if we look at um, paragraph 15, this question of confidentiality goes um, a bit further. Do you see paragraph 15? It's in relation to um, search warrants. Elders should never consent for anyone to search a kingdom hall or any other place where confidential records are stored. And then in particular, conscientious elders do all they reasonably and peaceably can to preserve the confidentiality of the congregation in harmony with the principle set out in Acts 5.29. Now, are you familiar with that, what that principle is, are you, Mr. Tool? 5.29. Well, Peter said to the apostles, we must obey God as ruler rather than men. Are you familiar with that? Yes. Now, isn't that a, a, a clear message that there are circumstances in which God's law or, or rule or requirement will override what the authorities may require? 
Well, that's possible, but I wonder if we could go back to paragraph, I think it's four of this document. I think it's four, let's see. Yes. There it says, direction on handling child abuse matters can be found in separate correspondence. However, we are pleased to provide consolidated direction in handling other congregation matters involving legal issues. So these are just general legal principles, and, uh, but it's not specifically dealing with child abuse matters. Oh, no, I accept that, but dealing with it at the level of general legal principles, you will accept that what is said here and in reliance on um, Acts 5.29, there's a clear message sent to people, which is to not cooperate with secular authorities unless you have to. No. The principle of 529 is that we will obey the authorities in whatever they ask us to do, but there is a, a relative subjection in the sense that we won't do what they ask us to do if they ask us to break God's law. And I think Mr Spinks basically touched on that fairly clearly yesterday. So if, if in fact there is no basis to be able to retain information, we willingly will provide it. If there's a subpoena to ask for documents, we'll provide it. If there's a, a protection to that document, well, then that might be a different situation. But uh, if there's no legal protection... And when it comes to child abuse matters, you may or may not be aware that ever since 1999, we've cooperated with the authorities as far as I understand, on every instance where the authorities have asked for information, elders have made statements, they've appeared as witnesses, documents have been produced when they've been requested. We have been absolutely open every time we've been approached by the authorities in relation to this matter. I'm just addressing this right now at the level of the message that is sent to people reading Jehovah's Witness publications, including elders and, and publishers. So let me give you another example. If we can go to 127, that's tab 127, mm -hmm. and starting at the first page so you can see what the publication is, it's Keep Yourselves in God's Love. Yes. And it's published in 2008. And again, this is a November 2014 printing of that publication, published by the governing body. And if we can look at page 59... That's ringtail 16. Uh, paragraph 18. It deals with the concept of taking up the complete suit of armor. And you'll see it says, those who keep themselves in God's love also enjoy spiritual protection from Satan, who wants to deprive Christians not just of happiness but of everlasting life. And then it's this bit that I'm interested in. It says, we have a struggle, said Paul, not against blood and flesh, but against the governments, against the authorities, against the world rulers of this darkness, against the wicked spirit forces in the heavenly places. And there's a scriptural support for that. The word struggle suggests that our fight is not long distance from the safety of hidden bunkers and so on. Um, furthermore, the terms governments, authorities and world rulers indicate that attacks from the spirit realm are highly organized and deliberate. And what I'm suggesting to you is that this sends out a very clear message that uh, adherence to the Jehovah's Witness system of beliefs should be skeptical of secular authorities and not cooperate with them unless they really have to. I completely disagree. Oh. Well, how are we to understand this? We're talking about... Uh spiritual things in terms of uh, Satan, demons, things that are really trying to attack your faith. There's a battle to be able to preserve morality and preserve a code of uh, behaviour that's acceptable to Christians is a battle in today's world. But can I just, again, just point you to something so that it really clarifies this issue? Of course, I'd welcome it. It's in Romans chapter 13. And it was read yesterday. But I just this is the message that all Christians... Jehovah's Witnesses take really seriously. Chapter 13, and it's talking about the governments. It's 
It's talking about the secular authorities here. It says, let every person, chapter 13, verse 1, let every person be in subjection to the superior authorities. For there is no authority except by God. The existing authorities stand placed in their relative positions by God. Therefore, whoever opposes the authority has taken a stand against the arrangement of God. And it says, those who have taken a stand against it will bring punishment against themselves. For these rulers are an object of fear, not to the good deed, but to the bad. Do you want to be free of fear of the authority? Keep doing good, and you will have praise from it. For it is God's minister to you for your good. But if you, do what is, if you are doing what is bad, be in fear. For it is not without purpose that it bears the sword. It is God's minister, an avenger to express wrath against the one practicing what is bad. There is therefore compelling reason for you to be in subjection, not only on account of the wrath, that's the authority of the government, or the secular authorities, but also on account of your conscience. So Christians are being told that they are duty-bound to be obedient to the governments. But simultaneously they're being told they're in mortal struggle against governments and authorities. You see, this is the difficulty, Mr. Toole. I accept that there are very clear scriptures like that, but it's the case too, isn't there, that there are equally clear scriptures reproduced and referenced in your publications which say just the contrary. I think if you read the whole of that in context and look at it, it's quite clear what it's saying. But one thing you could never, ever cite against Jehovah's Witnesses is that they are ever encouraged to disobey the law. We take it really seriously. In fact, if we weren't going to be obedient to the law, we'd be in contravention of what it says there in Romans chapter 13. Well, I, I'm not going to take up the invitation to <laughs> no. pursue that because that will really divert us. So I'll leave that for now uh, with the suggestion I've made to you and, and your response to it. Thank you. Now, in uh, paragraph 21... 21... of your statement, that is. Yes. Do you have that? You yes. say the legal department is not involved in managing the risk of child sexual abuse within the Jehovah's Witness, uh, Witnesses Church. That's as I understand it, because you advise on the legal obligations, is that right? That's right. Such as whether to report... That's as far as the legal department goes. Yes. Well, say that earlier you said it goes one step further. You, you as a practice, make it clear to the... Oh, others. yes, 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 what we've discussed. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, Right, now, just dealing with mandatory reporting requirements, you, you set out in your statement how they, currently the position of the law is, is that the mandatory reporting requirements vary from state to state and territory. I missed the first part of your... Uh... I said I'm moving now to deal with the question of mandatory reporting yes. requirements. You yes. set out in your statement that, insofar as the law is concerned, those yes. requirements vary across the states and territories of Australia. Is that right? Yes. And... I would take it then, and I'm asking you, that that's burdensome on an organisation such as yours uh, to keep track of the differences in each state and have to advise accordingly. Yes. Whether it's achievable or not, of course, is another question entirely, but I take it you, as a lawyer, the senior lawyer in, in the organisation, would um, welcome it if the requirements across the states and territories were made uniform? Yes, I would. Now, with regard to confessional privilege, um, which you um, mention in, in various places, um, but, for example, let's look at your paragraph 29. 29? And you'll see in 29A, you're dealing with South Australia, and you say a number of nominated persons in various professions, including ministers of religion, and, and you go on, are required to report. And uh, 
Um, and then four lines down, you say, provided that the suspicion is formed in the course of the person's work or in carrying out their official duties within the exception of disclosures made in the confessional. So might to understand there that, that leaving aside this specific wording of the law in question, that in South Australia the position is, is there's an exception for disclosures made in a confessional setting. Is that right? Yes. And then 29B, um, in relation to Victoria, equally in the, in the sixth line, uh, you say this obligation does not apply if the belief was obtained in a religious uh, confession. Yes, correct. And I think I took you to the paragraph earlier in another document that referred to minister communicant um, privilege. Now, it's really that that I'm addressing within the Jehovah's Witness context. You, as I understand it, advise elders on their obligations under these provisions? Yes. So you would be involved in advising when this confessional exception uh, is available to them or not? The last 15 years, even if it was a confession, if the authorities approach the elders seeking information, they have completely cooperated. So, so there's been no claim for confessional privilege at all during that period. So do I understand from that that within the Jehovah's Witness view of things, uh, the, the, an obligation, confidence that arises from a confession being made is one that is overridden by any requirements of the law? That's the position we've taken. Not, the, not so in some other religions where a, a priest who receives uh, a confession in the requisite circumstances would face jail before breaking the confidence of that confession. Yes, that's the situation. And uh, within the Jehovah's Witness uh, understanding of things, what would be the elements or the requirements for uh, something to amount to a confession? Well, someone confesses. As simple as that. Well, I guess you can have in different settings, but if somebody came to me personally and confessed, I'd consider that as a confession. If it was a serious matter that we were dealing with and... Uh, there was a judicial committee, and the person confessed to what, uh, in fact, was it some wrongdoing or whatever? That would be a confession. All right. Let, let, me, let me clarify. In the first example you gave, someone came to you. I take it that's you as an elder. Yes, that's what I mean. Um, so it would need to be to an elder or an elder of the organisation, not someone else. Would that be one of the elements? <coughs> Yes, that would be one of the elements. And would uh, uh, would there would another element be that the confession was made confidentially? In other words, that the person made it in circumstances where a confidence attached to it. it in circumstances of confidence, yes, that would be the case. And that would would that include in circumstances where? the elder to whom the confession was made was not going to pass it on to others? Well, that would depend upon uh, the usage, for example, of the church. For example, if in fact a confession had been made about a very serious matter, the usage of the church in the context of that would be to mention to the body of elders that a very serious matter, broadly the nature of that wrongdoing without any details, and then the body of elders would appoint a committee to meet with that individual, they would then all collectively hear the confession. And that might then lead to a judicial committee? Yes, or that would be, yes. And that would lead to a report to the branch? Yes, and the report to the branch would simply set out, that would be handled in the service department, they would simply, uh, under the same cloak of confidentiality, they would take that, put it in the file, if it was, for example, something, and then it would be filed there, child abuse permanently. And, and available uh, for people having the requisite 
authority or responsibility in the branch to access in years to come? Uh, in terms of uh, the service department, those that were charged with that, yeah, that would be the usage of the church, you know, the usage of uh, a confessional structure, yes. And the details would be filed also in the congregation files? Uh, yes, basic details, yes, because now if we're talking about a child abuse matter or just generally... Well, let's be specific about child abuse. We may as well take that as an example. Well, that would be... The, the, the branch now in the service department retains all the, the files in relation to that. The congregation there, if they dealt with it, have uh, sufficient just to be aware of what had, what had happened. But there would be a notation there, but it would be retained in the, uh, in the, in the service department. Is it not the case that some report has to be put in a sealed envelope and kept in the congregation files? Yeah, yes, a brief little report, yes. Yes, and that's... There's a purpose to keeping it in the files that so that it can be referred to in the future if it needs to be. Uh, yes, if, uh, if that was the case, yes. And that may be elders some years down the track who had no involvement earlier on. Well, the direction is that anyone that opens that letter should be one of the people that were involved in handling the matter. Well, so the that might not always be possible, but that's getting, the direction. Getting to Mr Tool, as, as you will have seen, is really the confidentiality of the confession in the case of the Jehovah's Witnesses is very uh, qualified, isn't it? That it can go, it can end up being a lot of different people who end up having access to that information. That's possible, but in view of the position we've taken in this country <coughs> as far as uh, disclosing information, if, uh, if the authorities seek information about the particular confession in relation to child abuse matters, we've uh, been forthcoming and we've waived any privilege that might otherwise have existed anyway. Yes, well, of course... That may not always be the case. I mean, there may be circumstances in which you change the position. That's potentially the case, yes. Now, dealing with the question of working with children or analogous checks, <clears throat> I understand that um, if someone is nominated to be an elder, uh, then a working with children clearance is sought. Is that right? Well, they normally would have had one before they were nominated as an elder because even as a ministerial servant, they're required to have one before they can serve in that capacity in those states where it's a requirement. OK. And what happens when uh, someone is nominated or there's an intention to nominate someone and they can't get that clearance? They're not appointed. And the, the efficacy of that system of the working with children and analogous check system, of course depends upon the authorities having a database of information with regard to, to sexual offences, is that yes, right? Yes, I understand, sir. Um, so that they can then reference that database to decide whether a clearance will be given in a particular case or not given. Yes. And so the efficacy of the um, system then depends on what information is furnished to the authorities to be captured in the database. I, that's a corollary, yes, I because, uh, What I suggest is that if the Jehovah's Witnesses don't systematically report offenders uh, within their midst, midst, then that information doesn't get to the authorities and it undermines the efficacy of the system. Place to some degree, but on the other hand, to report the matter when they're not required to if the, uh, if the people involved who are the victim in this instance don't want it reported, you've got two contrary principles common to competing with each other. In actual fact, under those circumstances, to go and report it anyway in the face of someone saying, I don't want it reported, when there was no requirement for the uh, minister to report it, basically means that uh, you're walking all over the right of someone to decide what is in their best interest. You've traversed that and you've accepted there may very well be circumstances in which yeah. a person's not in a position yeah. uh, to report or they require reporting in order to be protected. So the blanket statement doesn't yes. apply across the board. But, Mr Tool, you'll appreciate there's a distinction between what the law may require and what is right and what is wrong. And what we're really explore, exploring here is what is the right way uh, in which these matters should be handled mm -hmm. with reference to morality 
And what I'm exploring is, with, as it would appear, with reference to the Jehovah's Witness morality, it's not regarded as right to have a systematic system of reporting credible child sexual abuse allegations arising in your communities to the authorities. The position basically is that it's not right to overturn someone's right to decide whether they want it done. Elders are simply not scripturally authorised to uh, take over the best interests of someone's family. Yes, but we've, we, I think we've canvassed that, Mr Tool. There are circumstances in which uh, a child, the allegation a child may have, will not be reported by his or her parent or guardian. And others, uh, having responsibilities within that community, such as elders, are in a position to report to the authorities and protect the child but you won't do it? Well, we would do it if we felt it was necessary to protect the child, unhesitatingly. If I came across a situation and the only way that I believed I could protect a child that was in danger, I would have absolutely no hesitation at all in going to the authorities, even though I'm not required by a mandatory reporting law. So you say the only reason why there's never been such a report is because those circumstances haven't arisen? Uh, you're presupposing there's never been a report. Well, that's the evidence for the motion thus far. I, I don't think you can conclude that automatically. As was pointed out yesterday, there are some... Of the cases that you have, there are some 383 that have had police or authority involvement in it. Uh, the extent to which elders may or may not have reported that, I have no idea. But I do know that, according to the figures that are produced, there are some 383 times the authorities have been involved. So... I, I can't tell you. Well, let's just deal with the 383. That figure was arrived at by doing a search of words yes. in the files for things like police, authority, and so on. So the authorities were involved in well, it? Well, they may not have been, because the, what was actually written on the document might have say, said, do not report to the authorities. The search would have picked up the word authorities, and you've counted in the 383. Well, even so, the point that I'm making, if you divided the figure substantially. It still is impossible for me to agree that elders have never gone because I simply don't know, but I do know the authorities have been involved in a number of those cases. And for several weeks now you've had those uh, figures and the Royal Commission's analysis of your 1006 <coughs> perpetrator files and you've not found a single case where there was a report by the elders or by the branch other than where there may have been a mandatory requirement? Well, I haven't been looking through the cases and I haven't been looking through the, uh, the numbers. All I'm saying is a general proposition to say it's never happened. Uh, it may well not even appear in the, uh, in the file to say that the elder went. It may just say that, that the authorities became involved. I don't know what the circumstances are in every case. And I'm not trying to make uh, a major point out of it at all. I'm just simply saying it's very difficult to say definitively that elders have never been involved in reporting a case because we just don't have the facts to be able to base that on. Well, but in terms of mandatory reporting in those files, that's not the case. Yes. Well, you'll accept there's no evidence of elders ever having reported other than when it, they were mandatorily required to do so. I haven't reviewed all the files, but in simple terms, I assume... Uh, if, that's, if that's the way the files read, I assume that must be correct, but I, I'm not prepared to accept the proposition the elders have never been involved when, in fact, I don't have the facts to be able to substantiate that. Well, just on the files, you've had, you may not have searched the files, but you've had the opportunity to do so, haven't you? Well, for the last little while, I've had hardly the opportunity to do anything in responding to the requests of the Royal Commission. We've been working t to bend over backwards to cooperate and... Uh, hardly had time to turn around. So uh, that's why I asked someone else if they would do it. That's what they came back and said. So you did have someone search the files? Well, that's did exactly what you've said there on those word, on those word uh, things on the files that you had, the, the figures that you gave us. Yes. Yes, well, that, that's in the, in the correspondence I attended yesterday. Yeah. Um, I'd like to take you to tab 115.
Um, you'll see this is a letter from the Australia branch, September 12, 2008, <coughs> to, it says, Service Committee. As I understand that, that's to the Service Committee of the Governing Body. Would that be right? Yes, that would be correct. Um, and it was from, uh, if you see on the second page, Mr. Uh, Moritz, and he preceded you as being the senior lawyer uh, at the branch, is that right? No, that's not correct. <clears throat> okay, I apologise. Who, who was he? This is uh, Harold Vivian Moritz. He's the brother of the person that was involved in the legal department. Thank you. And he was a member of the branch committee, was he? Yes, he was. Oh. <clears throat> and was this a letter you were involved in at all? No. You'll see in the third paragraph uh, on the first page... When I say he wasn't involved, I didn't write the letter. That's what I mean. I might have had some, there might have been some discussions with me about certain things. But well, uh, do you remember were there or were, you, were there not? Yes, there would have been some discussion, but I just didn't draft the letter. That's all I'm saying. Okay. Well, you see, it says there you ask. So that's to the governing body. You, the governing body, ask or the service committee about how we propose to track persons who are accused and or disfellowship for child molestation and other abuse. We intend to continue doing what we have done in the past, that is, maintaining a list of such individuals along with the necessary details of what transpired. All appointments processed by the service department are checked against the list of names. Um, <clears throat> so there is, there is a list of names, I take it, as referred to there in that letter. Uh, my understanding, this is all done in the service department, but my understanding is they simply use the case files. So they may have a list of case files, but they just use the case files that they have. So That's their checking mechanism, as I understand. So but I've had no involvement with that at all. So there is a list of names? Well, there's a list of cases, the cases that you've got. Well, there are, there are a number of... There are 1,006 files. We've produced our own list. I understand that no separate list of the files was, was produced to us, but uh, I assume that the branch office in addressing correspondence to the governing body takes care to be accurate in what they say. Well, I'm, I'm certain. And would not say that there's a list of names if there wasn't a list of names. I assume they've just... Uh, I've asked the question of... Uh the service department, and that's what, that's what I've been told, that they simply use the case files. So they, they possibly have a list of the case files they've got. That would be fairly logical. But beyond that, I can't help you because I, I'm not involved in that area. But is there a list of the case files? Beg your pardon? Is there a list of the case files? I don't know. Well, a subpoena was issued um, by the Royal Commission. It's subpoena number S hyphen yes. NSW hyphen four six two uh, on the looks like the twenty eighth of May, twenty fifteen, in which um, what was sought was in relation specifically to this letter, this letter was identified, and what was sought was a list of all individuals who are accused and or disfellowship for child molestation and other abuse, and nothing has been produced. Are you able to explain that? All I can explain is that uh, on the basis of that summons, we have, complied, we have attempted to comply as fully as possible. My understanding is there is no list as such. They use the case files. Which you've, what you've got, that's what I've been told. If there is no list as such, then the branch committee is um, not putting the facts to the governing body and saying there is a list. Well, I can't say what they'll put into them. I, as I said, I wasn't involved. So I call for the list of names referred to in this document, and perhaps my friend can respond sometime later as to just what the position is. I'm happy to do so, Your Honor. I just want to take you specifically to the case of BCG mm -hmm. um, and to tab 38 in volume 1. Uh, 
this is a letter from BCK, and that is BCG's um, eldest sister. And it's written across the face of it, attention, VIN tool, private and confidential. Uh, and it has a fax header of it of 15 October 2002. And the letter itself is dated 13 October 2002. Now, did this letter come to you? I believe so. And do you know how it came to you? In other words, did it come to you from BCK or did it go to someone else and then sent to you? I don't recall, but I know BCK personally, so I assume it was just faxed to, uh, to the branch office, but I can't tell you specifically how it got to me. Yes. And uh, if you read that opening paragraph where she says she's writing about some concerns that she has about her father, yes. she says she's concerned that he may still have contact with young children in his congregation and they may be in danger of being um, abused by him. Perhaps we should just, on the chronology, um, understand that the time of this letter, October 2002, um, BCH had been reinstated, having, having been um, reinstated in November 1992. That's what I understand. And uh, I'm sure not many of his congregation are aware of his attitude towards paedophilia and may unknowingly expose their children to risk. As you are most probably aware, he has had a long history of abusing children, starting with myself when I was very young, and even though after learning the truth from the Bible and bringing his life into harmony with it for a time, he later allowed himself to other incidents. And um, so um, she goes on. Um, what did you do in response to this letter, do you recall? No, I don't specifically recall. Um, do you recall that at that time, BCH was at the Logan Home Congregation? I don't think I had any idea where he was at that time. But you would have been able to find out very easily? Yes, I could. Yes, and do you recall whether you did find out? No, I would only say what I would have been my practice, that if I received a letter like this, I would have taken it to the service department and then they would have dealt with the matter because that's their, that's their role. And if you look at the next tab, tab 39, this is now uh, 10 days later, and again it's addressed private and confidential to your attention from BC. BCK, uh, did you receive this letter? Did I receive this letter? Yes, I did, I believe. And you see there's a... Uh, I, I withdraw that. And you see she says, in my letter dated October 13, 2002, which is the one we've just looked at, I spoke about how my father has abused my two sisters. Uh, referring to the younger sisters, one of whom has spoken to me about what my father did to her, and because this matter has not been dealt with, I feel I have an obligation to let you know what she told me. Uh, and then she goes on detailing what she'd been told with regard to a very serious sexual assault, you'd agree? Yes. Yes. And what did you do in response to this letter? Again, I don't recall, but... My practice would have been just to take that up to the service department. These are very serious um, matters that would have been brought to your attention, weren't they? The letters are obviously bringing it to my attention. And the underlying concern in those letters was a current concern with regard to child safety. And I was also aware that there was a court case going on at that time involving the very issues that, uh, in principle, are being raised in these letters. Yes. Did you follow up with the service desk as to what had been done, whether anything had been able to be achieved? I don't recall. Uh, <clears throat> Mr. Spinks yesterday ex explained that the reference 
on a letter to LLC as a reference to the legal department. Do you, do you agree with his evidence? Here's the trial. Yes. I'll show you um, tab 40. Four zero. You'll see this is a letter um, a week or so later uh, to the presiding overseer at the Logan Home Congregation, and it's the references LLC. I take it that came from the legal department. I've seen that letter. I looked at it in the bundle. That is the symbol that I used. I don't recall writing this letter. I must have had some input into it, or I wouldn't have my symbol on top. But uh, I don't disagree with the contents. Well, what this letter does, uh, Mr. Toole, is it asks the Logan Home congregation to look into the position of BCH and to appoint two elders to approach him and inform him of various things. And he should be asked to explain uh, and so on as an investigation preceding a possible judicial committee, not so based on the fact that he's supposedly, according to paragraph two, is it, that he's actually on the public record of uh, pleading guilty to uh, these charges. Now, what this suggests, uh, Mr. Toole, is that what you did in response to the two letters is you wrote this letter to the congregation. You didn't take, it to the, take the letters to the service department. No, I would never deal with a, a matter. This is a service department matter. But because it's a court case on foot, they no doubt came and discussed it with me. Maybe I, maybe I produced a rough draft that was finalised, but uh, anything to do with child abuse is service-related. This letter carries your reference, and it deals with legal matters. Are you, you seem to be trying to distance yourself from it and suggest that this came from the service department. No, I'm not suggesting that. I'm saying it would have gone through with the approval of the service department. That's all. The approval of the service department, but sent and signed off by you. Well, I never signed. I never didn't sign the letter. It would have gone through the service department out to the congregation. Approved by you. Well, it would. If I drafted the letter, the whole of the letter, I would have been happy with it. But if, when it went to service, they may well have wanted to revise various aspects of it. You mean to say the way in which your office runs is that the letters with your reference on them that you didn't approve? Anything at all to do with service, to do with uh, child abuse, that's dealt with by the service department. Well, that can't be so, because this letter and many others in the bundle here have LLC or LLD and so on. Yes, them. that's true. Yes. That's true, but it all goes back through the service department, because they're the ones responsible for dealing with these matters. Now, they might have had some legal input or some input from the legal department, but nevertheless... It all goes back through there because they're responsible. We are really just assisting them in relation to what they're doing. And in assisting them, this is the way forward that, that you uh, were party to. In other words, writing to the congregation, congregational elders and telling them what they should do. Is that right? Well, in this particular instance, that seems as uh, clearly what the letter is saying to do, yes. And there's nothing in here about uh, investigating the safety of children in that congregation from BCH and taking any steps that might be required? No, there, is, there isn't. Yes. But it is asking them to directly address a very serious matter. Well, if we take a look at tab 41... Yes. Uh, you'll see in January of 2003... You wrote a, well, on the face of it, a memorandum from you. It says legal dash v tool to the service department. I yes, that's it, correct. This did actually come from you, this one. Yes, no question about that. I remember that. And dealing further with this uh, question of BCH and his uh, history in the Jehovah's Witness Church, not so. Yes. And you conclude at the end, if we can look at page three. We'll agree that you identify the concern now is not about uh, the child sexual abuse itself, but about whether uh, BCH is lying about it. 
No, I disagree entirely. Explain why? The issue here, right at the very outset of that uh, memorandum, it spoke about some documents that had been shown to me. I don't know what they are, I can't remember, so obviously it was discussing something that had transpired from uh, the committee up there. But what I'm saying here is the primary issue is this man is lying about abusing his daughter. This man has already admitted to abusing his daughter and now he's denying it. Like that's the context of this particular memo is to show he's lying about abusing his daughter. Well, I thought that's what I put to you, that the principal issue you determined there is, uh, it says, the last line, your conclusion, the primary issue before the present committee is the charge of lying. No, but you didn't actually put it to me quite that way. That's not what I said. That's what you said. I said it's lying about abusing his daughter, not just simple lying. He's actually lying about abusing his daughter. So the context, it's the lie in the context of abusing his daughter. I guess this is, this is really serious. This man had abused his daughter. Shockingly, Plural. he'd admitted it. Daughters. And then now he's compounding the whole thing by now going back and denying that he actually abused his daughter. Well, I have to say, I find it very hard to, to see the lying about it nearly as serious as the, as the <coughs> fact of the abuse itself. Well, the fact of the abuse itself is, is incredibly serious. But more to the point, why was this a legal matter? I, pre I presume the service had come and asked me some questions about it, so uh, I sent them back that memo, really quite clearly showing this man's history, but what he'd actually done, according to what uh, the elders had said, and just making sure they were very aware of this man's you know, shocking behaviour and his... Uh, Denial of all this. Because it's not clear to me at least why a person lying to congregational elders about conduct that he's been engaged in is a legal matter or a criminal matter. I think the situation was the service department would have been very conscious of the fact that this man's in the middle of a court case and uh, they would have obviously come to sort of raise it in that context. But please... Whatever you do, don't conclude that this wasn't a serious matter. The context of that is this man had admitted to abusing his daughter and now he was denying that he actually did it. He's actually compounding the treatment he'd given to his daughter. The conclusion I suggest is that you take the lying about it more seriously than the abuse itself. Absolutely not. Those are my questions for this witness. Does anyone else have any questions? A few? Yes, Your Honour. I see more people rising. I think we might take the morning adjournment then. Awesome. Made applicable throughout the world. Yes, the general policy would be determined by the governing body, but the application of it in the local setting would depend on the branch committee applying it to, to the relevant things in their local area. Well, yes, whether a policy is actually followed in practice is a separate question, but dealing with the setting of, the, of the, what the practice is supposed to be, that's set by the governing body. That's what I understand. Yes. And coming to the question of responses to child sexual abuse allegations specifically, the Australia branch then follows the guidelines of the governing body, is that right? the guidelines, but they will apply it in, in any way that needs to be adjusted in the local, for the local area. Well, let's just be clear on that. The particular application may vary from case to case, is that yes. right? Yes. But uh, that application is intended to be within the parameters of the policy or procedure itself, is that right? Yes, I'd agree with that. And it's the case, is it not, that the Australia branch uh, office <coughs> will not itself set any practice or policy to apply normatively unless it's been approved by the governing body? 
in terms of policy, uh, they will adjust it to the local circumstances. So, for example... <coughs> As Your Honour, please, the first uh, witness today will be Mr Vincent Tu. Uh, it's necessary for you to be sworn. Would you take an oath on the Bible? Yes, certainly. <coughs> Just excuse my voice a little bit. It's... Uh... That's all right. Problems. Would you just hold the Bible and repeat after me, I swear by Almighty God. I swear by Almighty God. That the evidence I shall give in this Royal Commission. That the evidence I shall give in this Royal Commission. Shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Thank you. Take a seat. Yes, Mr Stewart. Mr Toole, will you state your full names, please? Vincent Joseph Toole. Do you have a copy to hand of your statement dated 10 July 2015? Yes, I do. Are there any amendments or corrections you wish to make to the statement? No. Do you confirm the statement to be true and correct? Yes. I tender the statement, Your Honour. Mr. Toole's statement will be Exhibit 2923. Now, Mr. Toole, as I understand it, you were baptised as a Jehovah's Witness in 1972, is that right? Yes, that's correct. How old were you then? Uh, I was born in 1948, so uh, probably 23, 24. And how did you come to be a Jehovah's Witness? I was... Uh, I moved into a unit with someone who was having a, a Bible study. I'd been brought up quite religiously. I'd attended a religious boarding school for five years prior to that, but after I left school... I basically stopped attending church and uh, later on when I moved into this unit, this man was studying. I'd never really read a Bible before. But Mr. Tool, sorry to interrupt you. I'm just looking for a short answer. So oh. you were introduced through someone you were sharing. Yes, and uh, I studied and was satisfied this was the truth and I wanted to uh, dedicate my life to serve God. Thank you. And you were appointed an elder, as I understand it, in 1977, is that right? Yes, that's correct. And as I understand it, between being baptised and being appointed an elder, typically there would be no formal uh, full-time training that someone would go through before being appointed an elder? No formal training, no. Yes. So it would be through involvement in the various activities of the congregation and yeah. the teaching and so on, etc. No tertiary education or anything like that. It was just involvement in the church, application and involvement as such. Yes. And you were a circuit overseer from 1980 to 1989, is that right? Yes. And from 1989, you commenced working at the um, branch headquarters, is that right? Yes, that's correct. And would it be right to refer to that as Bethel? Yes, that's another term. And, and that term is also used to refer to the world headquarters in Brooklyn, is that right? Yes, that's correct. Now... When you commenced working at branch headquarters, is it then that you commenced your legal studies? Yes, not long after I arrived there. Yes. And did the branch committee or did the Jehovah's Witnesses then sponsor your legal studies? Yes. And in 1993, you completed those studies and were admitted as a solicitor, is that right? Yes, that's correct. And since then, you've done legal work for uh, Jehovah's Witness Australia or Watchtower and Bible and Tract Society Australia on a voluntary basis. Is yes, that right? that's correct. Yes. And since 1995, you have also had your own legal practice under the name Vincent Tool Solicitor. Yes, that's correct. And that legal practice, does that do independent work outside of Jehovah's Witness work or do you only do Jehovah's Witness work through that practice? Primarily just Jehovah's Witness work, but I've done work for my family and other people. Yes. Um, but am I to understand you don't run it as a commercial no. law practice? 
not as a commercial practice, no. And since 2010, as I understand it, you've had oversight of the legal department in Australia, is that right? Yes, that's correct. So you were involved in the legal department, am I right, since 1989 and had oversight since 2010? That's correct. And I take it then you also live at Bethel? Yes, I do. And you, your daily needs are provided for as a member of the worldwide order of special full-time servants of Jehovah's Witnesses, is that right? Yes, that's correct. Yes, in much the same way that Mr. Spinks described yesterday. Yes, exactly. And if I can refer to your statement and starting at paragraph 13. Paragraph 13? Yes. Mm -hmm. You say all elders serving in congregations of Jehovah's Witnesses throughout the world have been directed to contact the legal department in their local branch as soon as they learn of an allegation involving child sexual abuse. So am I to understand that the, there's a uniform um, process set out which applies throughout the world? Subject to the fact, of course, that uh, many branches mightn't have a legal department, but they would contact the branch there. But uh, in Australia, we do have a legal department. Yes. And that um, process, which is applicable throughout the world, uh, that's determined by the governing body? Well, it's a general direction throughout the world, as I understand. Yes, and it's a general direction throughout the world determined by the governing body. Well, as far as I understand, it's a, it's a direction that uh, elders have been given. Yes, but um, Mr. Toole, you seem to be trying to avoid what I understand to be quite well accepted, which is that it's the governing body that determines that direction. That's what I understand, yes. Yes. And that's typical, is it, of all Jehovah's Witnesses policies and procedures, that is, they're determined by the governing body and 